So my clock is it says it's a minute to go. My clock says it's a minute late. Maybe you should take the average. The average is right. Oh, it's right on. It's correct. Exactly two o'clock. Yes, I'm introducing Ben Jung today because I probably know him better than almost anybody here. And he's certainly no stranger to NCARB. He received his Bachelor of Science in EE. How many here have a degree in engineering? All right. Welcome to the club. And from Zhejiang University in Hangzhou in China. Went to Dartmouth, got a Ph.D. in engineering sciences with a heavy emphasis on engineering physics, would you say? Okay. Actually taught a couple of courses there and then came for a postdoc here at HAO. And then sadly left Boulder and HAO about a year and a half ago to take a faculty position at Hong Kong University in the Earth Sciences Department. Talk about putting a square peg in a round hole. But anyway, he's thriving there. Ben is going to tell us, and I have a footnote to this title, Ben's going to be telling us about doing more with more, harnessing next generation supercomputers to move beyond global magnetospheric modeling in the fluid world. And the footnote is this. NCAR used to have a supercomputer that pushed Moore's law, that Ohm's law has been seriously undermining that capability lately, as you all know. All right. Thanks a lot. It's really nice to come back here again after about 18 months. It's really nice to see everybody here. But if you look at the simulations like outer heliosphere, it's only like a couple of steps, right? So it's not that long. So I have this title called, you know, looking at the high resolution simulations from Gamera and trying to push the limit beyond the fluid limit. But that's not the key point, the major part of my talk today. So I'm going to mostly show you what we've done to try to push the model resolution to be like extremely high, which is extremely expensive. And I'm going to focus on more on the MI coupling and the aurora modeling and when you go to higher, higher resolution and what kind of stuff that you can do. All right. So this is my the team members, basically the APL folks, Kareem, Slava, and Jeff is our new software engineer. He's very good. He's the main person that does all these MPI parallelization and John Line and Mike Wilberger, who's still doing BBF analysis for us. All right. So this is the outline of my talk. It's going to be a quick introduction on what is the LFM global magnetosphere model. For some of you may not be familiar with that. And also the next part will be the Gamera code, which is an upgrade of the LFM that carries the LFM legacy on and on. And also I'm going to show some high res Gamera sphere simulations. We call it Gamera sphere because it could be Earth, Saturn, Jupiter, Neptune, all kinds of things. But the main part is Earth, but it's called Gamera sphere. And also future work. All right, so uh, to start to look at to the LFM global image decode, and some of you here might might be very familiar with this code, and lots of, for me, like I did a thesis on the on the LFM code, I'm still doing this research with the LFM code. So it's called the line fed Mulberry global image decode, which is mainly developed by uh, Professor John Lai at Dartmouth in the early 80s. Uh, by the time he was in NRL, I think, at that time. And also, uh, Joe Feather and Clark Mulberry. So um, <clears throat> it's been a backbone of the CISM geospace models for a while. So LFMs have been coupled to all kinds of other uh, non MHG regional models, global models, ionic thermosphere, all kinds of things. So, uh, so you might be also familiar with this paper, which is John's uh, 2004 JST paper uh, talking about the numerics details of the numerics of the LFM. So a couple of notes I found interest, uh, interesting of the facts is that the three-dimensional solver of the LFM code is actually done in 1982. That's confirmed with John, right, so three decades ago. 
and the ionosphere solver for the magnetosphere is done in 1986, but not until 2004 the paper is published, which means that before 2004 the code is a mystery, you know, in the street. Right. So in Who's 2001, this paper was one of the great accomplishments of the of the CISN of project. The of the <laughs> forcing John to write a paper on this, by, well, authored by Lion, Fetter, and Mulberry. Mulberry. Yeah. <laughs> That's good to know. All right. So um, so that then after 2000, when the CISN started and the group started to collaborating with the NCAR, RCN, Arise people and uh, BU and started to the coupling to other non-MHD physics is a couple of key is that Tai GCM was coupled uh, su successfully in 2001 and that model is called CMIT, coupled magnetosphere ionosphere thermosphere model. And the ring current model, which is a rise convection model, is called LFM RCM, is coupled in 2012 and paper came after that. And also uh, we did multi-fluid multi -fluid extension of the uh, MHD model, which is called the MFLFM, which is multi-fluid LFM. That was done near 2009, maybe earlier, because that's the first um, multi-fluid paper comes up. And the numerous paper is still coming. You know, it's going to come sometime. All right. So um, based on the LFM MHD code, and we have developed lots of applications. For example, the most uh, well known in the community is probably the Earth magnetosphere model, is the LFM magnetosphere model. And also, uh, Slava and company have developed the LFM helium model, which is the inner heliosphere model, solve the solar wind propagation from above the transition region to 1 AU. And uh, recently, we've done the Ju Jupiter and Jupiter and Saturn model, which is also uh, used to look at the dynamic uh, coupling with the solar winds. And there's another version called the box model. That's a Cartesian version of the LFM model. It has been used to study uh, local reconnection with uh, you know, uh, reconnection properties. And it also had other applications you know, randomly appear in JGRs, like the Venus model is like 1998, outer heliosphere, 1998. And also some unpublished results like Saturn and Jupiter. We've seen these results from John, but none of these were published, which Neptune is really, really interesting. All right, so, so uh, this is uh, about the first uh, picture of the, uh, I, no, probably not, but the most, uh, the one I found interesting is about the global magnetosphere simulation about 30 years ago. So that's a GGR paper from John. At, uh, uh, in 1986, and this is a two-dimensional magnetosphere simulation using 60 by 20 cells. So you have 60 cells in the x direction and 20 cells in the z direction. All right. So it has to use a 20th order finite difference method in order to resolve two things. One is the magnetopause, the other one is the magnetosheath. Because you only have 60 cells, right? So your cell size will probably be like one RE. Right? So if, if you don't use a high resolution, scheme and there's no sheath. It's just a shock passing and nothing, nothing's there. So this is the one that uh, using an extremely high order scheme, uh, high order difference, finite difference scheme to resolve the magneto sheath. So 30 years ago, if you can do a magneto sheath with a two dimensional image model which has memory probably much less than your cell phone, the orders of magnitude less than your cell phone, you can get a paper in JGR easily, right? But that's 30 years ago. Right, so that, by that time, we do magnetosheath and Bauschalk, all these. And nowadays, things are slightly different because we can go to very high resolution simulations. This is from Mike Wilberger's 2016 paper. Uses use the standard LFM scheme, which is the eighth order reconstruction method. And with that model, and you can do Kelvin Helmholtz instabilities, BBFs, FTEs, and we can model the plasma spheres, UF waves, alphenic activities, and all kinds of other phenomena. So these are the new capabilities as time goes on with more computational power and more resource. All right, so I did a bit, a little bit, this, this is not exclusive, but this is kind of like the modeling capability of the LFM geospace model that I can do. So you can see that uh, this is physical phenomena models and you can see that we can now do Bioshock menu pulse, that's easy, and KH, that's, LFM can do very nicely. FTEs, it's always it's on the day side and on high latitude and everywhere, but needs more analysis. And Mike's right, written uh, Mike and Slava's been done papers of the BBFs, bursty bulk flows. That's those fast flow channels in the tail. 
And also we've done UF waves and alphinic activities, alphine waves. And so we've done quite a few things with the cusp dynamics using the elephant model because you can resolve the very fine structure of the, the entry of the plasma. So moving on to the multifluid um, stuff, you can do plasma spheres and also ionospheric outflow. So that's the with the coupled other models like IPWM. So in the ionospheric coupling side, we can do electron precipitation with all kinds of different types. And ionospheric convection and field line currents, these are coming from electrostatic coupling of the magnetosphere currents. And also we do <coughs> have a model for pro proton precipitation, but it's never been used, it's just there. And um, for the drift kinetic green currents, as some of you may, may know that MHC does not have drift, uh, gradient curvature drift. The only drift you have, MHC has E cross B. So we need to couple to a ring current model, which is called Rice convection model. Also reads like ring current model. And also we've done lots of work, uh, also uh, using the LFM fields to push particles to study radiation belt physics. And with the SISM uh, efforts and the work that I've been working with uh, NCAR uh, colleagues, and we'll do thermosphere dynamics and TOIs kind of study with high resolution tight TCM coupled to the uh, LFM. And also we have uh, another other project working on the top side ionosphere plasma transfer ion outflow. So that's coupling the M MHD model with the outflow model with the tight GCM. So that's a, a more advanced one. And you see, it seems like you can do lots of things, right? But there are lots of things you cannot do, right? For example, substorms. There are substorms in LFM, but not really, right? Because the reconnection physics is, is not quite there. So it might be doing, give you something looks like substorm, but not probably not physically correct. And ion physics, no, because it's uh, ideal MHD. We don't have uh, other non-ideal MHD terms in the global model yet. And anisotropic, anisotropic pressure, and not yet and someone else has already done that. And Hall physics, I said yes and no, because we can do Hall physics for local simulations. For like a box, we can have the Hall term, we do have the Hall term, but for the global Earth magnetosphere, it's way too expensive. And we need the next generation of supercomputer to, to do that. And someone has to pay for the, the cost. All right, so more interesting, super storms. And I think to do superstorms, you need LFM, RCM, TIGCM, Outflow, maybe even WacomX, which means no. All right. <laughs> so what makes the LFM model so unique? And I have, uh, there are lots of reasons, but these are three things I think that's the most, uh, most uh, uh, important one is, one is the high resolving power numeric methods. So the numeric method, numeric error, is not a bottleneck of the model. Right? It's always, always the physics is the bottleneck. And also for the simulations with limited power, computational power, we have problem adapted grid design. So we have the design grid designed exactly for the magnetospheric problems or for the soaring problems to save lots of computational uh, resources. And also coupling to other physics codes, as I said, you know, the physics is, is always a bottleneck. So you have to consider non-MHD physics, different regional physics to do it. Right. So the high resolving power uh, scheme, some of you might have seen this plot from uh, John, John's uh, 2004 paper, and they're showing you the uh, advection of a, of a square wave across a grid over using a second order scheme, fourth order scheme, and eighth order scheme. So the dashed line is actually the, the initial profile, and then the solid line is the advected profile. And you can see that when you're going from second order to eighth order, and the gradient becomes sharper, which means, means that the, the scheme is resolving this kind of contact dis discontinuity better when using the eighth order scheme. And also we have defined a uh, interesting parameter called the relative Reynolds number. So that's the grid Reynolds number normalized by the grid Reynolds number that you get from a first order scheme. So the first order scheme is always one. And when you bump up the uh, order of reconstruction to eighth order, you can get 400. So that's in 1D means that in 3D, the grid Reynolds number relative to first order is 400 cubed. So that's a very high grid Reynolds number for three-dimensional flow simulations. So this is one of the reasons that LFM has very low numerical diffusions and always that the numerical errors are not constraining the solution. That's one thing you can, you can believe me. 
All right, so the second one is the grid de de uh, design. So this is the a typical magnetosphere grid that we use. It's a three-dimensional view, and this is the inner region. And you can see that it looks like a cylinder, but it's actually a spherical grid. So the outermost shell is deformed to be a cylinder because the solar wind is blowing this way. And looking from the solar wind, the magneto tail is more like a cylinder in this case. Right? So because we have non-orthogonal scheme to resolve the, solve the MHD equations, and you can, we can place most of the resolution in the regions that where we need the resolution, where the shocks are, and the magnetopoles, and also in the magnetosphere. So if I draw, I don't have a plot, but if you draw a line, like this circle down there, that will contain more than 80% of the computational cells because you don't really care about what's going on in these cells. So that's why the grid is uh, very effective. And talking about the third ones, the coupling to other physics codes, and this is the most uh, crazy and busy uh, plot, and if, you don't, if you're not familiar with these terms, it doesn't matter. But what happens here is that we have the LFM magnetosphere code with all kinds of MHD physics in it, and when we can solve the ionospheric electrodynamics with the mixed solver, it's magnetosphere ionosphere coupler solver, and also feeds these um, electron precipitation and uh, convection electric field to Tai GCM. So you can drive the Tai GCM in order to get the conductance. So that in that way, you get physics-based conductance calculations with causal, causally driven precipitation. And also, we can couple the uh, ring current model, which is a rice convection model, to the LFM to provide ring current. And you can get a better description of the region too currents and also the drift kinetics of the plasma population in the in the magnetosphere. So that's kind of the direction that we're moving forward to make the LFM model more and more capable of doing all these uh, complicated calculations. So uh, as some of you have may have already heard that we have already started a project to upgrade LFM to a new code called Gamera. So why do we need that? Because LFM sounds great, right? It does all these things and all these applications. So here's the reason. So the kernel of the LFM was written in the 80s, which is very, very old. And some of the Fortran subroutine, like I, I, I'm not even familiar with the syntax anymore. And it's, it's, it's very not very difficult, not very easy to read and uh, you know, to, to use. And also uh, the coupled code has lots of external library dependence made the code not less less portable, right? Not not exactly not portable, but very difficult to move it from NCAR computers to other computers. And also it's not ready for excess scale com computations of future computers, as some of you may have already uh, used to those coupled codes that we have limitations when you bump up the resolution and the comp computation time is just really, really, really long. And also it needs an upgrade of a sustainable future with public accessibilities. To me, it's open source. And I think open source is important for a software to be tested and validated and used by other groups with, among the com community. While with the LFM code, it's possible to open source, but I, it's, I can guarantee you that without expertise, you cannot use it. Right? You can have the code, but just you can't use it. So how are we going to do it? So we start from scratch. We're modern Fortran, Fortran 95, uh, Fortran 2003, and very, very minimal external library dependence for portability. And we preserve most of the key numerics underlying the LFM and with upgrades in the existing numerics. We did some upgrades to kill some of the, the old problems. And also we develop a general application, flexible, portable, uh, general purpose, <laughs> MHD code with coupling software, because we know that the non-MHD physics is important in doing a good job in geospace modeling. So that gives us Gamera. So here is Gamera, and some of you have seen this uh, turtle, which is uh, a, a turtle design, designed by artist at uh, Johns Hopkins, and um, I think they paid for it. And also, this Gamera means Grid Agnostic MHD for Extended Research Applications. So you can see it's a, it solves the, uh, the basic kernel, solves the ideal MHD equations as listed down here in a semi-conservative way, also conservative way. And uh, you can have extensions, right? So there are lots of features, and you don't need to read through all these details just to give you a basic sense. So it's multi-physics. Uh, it do, does ideal, resistive, and Hall MHD, and even other terms you can implement, and we've done it. And it's, uh, it has multi-fluid extensions, and it can solve semi or fully conservative e energy equations. So this is uh, uh, one. And then the numerical methods are fairly complicated. 
it, it has lots of heritages from the LFM code, but we made our own uh, developments based on. So you have its finite volume on non-orthogonal geometry with high order reconstruction and constraint transport. Constraint transport means that the magnetic field and uh, electric field are staggered. So they're on the ones on the face, ones on the edge, so which preserves the V0. So we have also uh, similar relative risk cor corrections for speed of light, which is also known as the Boris correction, and background field splitting, which is very important. Yes? What does semi refer to? Uh, so we only have the uh, we only have the displacement current in the momentum equation. We don't correct the mass, so there's no gamma factor in the in the mass and momentum. It's only correcting the um, the uh, displacement current. All right. So uh, the ring average for axis singularities. I'll explain to you what next. And these are the features for axis scale ready. So it's vectorized loops, hybrid parallelization, which is MPI over o OMP and application to, to various problems. So these are the uh, X scale ready. Right, so some of the key features in Gamera, and there are lots of features, but I think it's interesting ones, is the high order reconstruction on a non-orthogonal geometry. So you can see that this is a, re a typical reconstruction stencil in the uh, Gamera code, which is non-uniform and non-orthogonal. And also curvilinear geometry. So you can solve the equation in a curvilinear geometry, non-orthogonal, as long as you design the grid and you give the give the initial conditions, boundary conditions in the grid, and the code runs. It doesn't care what the grid looks like. And also constraint transport with a high order uh, constraint transport method, which is uh, fairly complicated. So um, this is a, a, a recent paper uh, accept, accepted by FJS, and um, it's, uh, it de describes every bit of detail of the Gamera numerics. So if you're interested in the numerical methods, you can go get that paper. And But it, it's a very long paper, it has 70, 76 pages with 150 equations. So which means that every bit of detail we use to calculate the solutions in Gamera, you can find that paper. So, or 99%, put it that way. All right, so like that this. Is, that is very commendable. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> all right, so this is a, uh, a uh, example solution. It's also in the paper, and you can download the, the movie from the paper as well, because there's animation in the paper as well. So you can see the blaster wave, MHD blaster wave solved in four different grids, Cartesian, spherical polar, or an, and a part of the spherical polar and the non-orthogonal warped geometry. So you can see that it's very hard to tell what's the difference between this, so the solution does not depend on what the grid look like, which is great, right? Because you don't want your solution to be dominated by the grids. What do you mean by curvilinear? Curvilinear, it means that it has to be structured. So it's like a logically Cartesian or logically spherical. So it's not like an unstructured grid, like a, a, what would you call these, like the football grid, right? It has to sphere. be cube sphere. A cube sphere is par partial, partially structured. So this is structured. So we can, we can, we can, uh, presumably we can do cube sphere. It just need to put the things together. So, but we've never done it. We've been talking about this, but no one's been doing that. All right, so uh, talking about the advection scheme, and this is a, an interesting test that I would like to show you the quality of the scheme is that this is a 2D advection. So what happens here is that you have a slaughtered cylinder of density enhancement. So you have sharp gradients contact and you have very changing, you know, quickly changing curvatures of uh, you know, all these structures. And then if it moves around, it, it's going to do a circular advection and get back to the back to the unit. And it's solved on four different grids. Cartesian, this is a mapped Cartesian to a, to, a, to a circle. And this is spherical. And this is a warped Cartesian. So you can see that the grid, the code preserved the shape quite well with some sp smearing on the boundary, right? So that smearing is very important in the numerical schemes, because if you do look at this plot, so this is a comparison between a second order scheme and the eighth order scheme used in Gamera. And you can see that on the non-orthogonal geometry. So you can see that these two actually looks pretty similar to each other, the boundaries, right? So if you cut a line through this location, which is y equals 0.75, and these are the profiles, so the difference is here. 
So you can see that the, the red profile and the blue pro profiles, they're about the same, right? But the difference here is the blue one, though you have to use uh, 1024 cells, 1024 by 10, 1024, while the red one is only 128. So there's a factor of eight difference in each dimensions, which means that in three-dimensional calculations, the difference is eight cubed, and computational will be eight to the fourth, because dt is one, one over eight as well. So that's why the high resolving power numerical schemes can give you structures that can be resolved with much less computational cells. So that's the one of the major advantage of, of Gamera. All right, so the ring average uh, stuff was also a, a, a nice, a very uh, neat technique that we used to resolve the pole problem, because in three-dimensional simulation, you always, ha you always have singularity in the pole. But the finite volume method doesn't matter with the singularity, it's a degenerated phase, but you still have a DT problem because the cell's clustering. So when you double the resolution, DT becomes one fourth. So we have this ring average technique developed, uh, which is published in JCP, and you can see that if we let a blast wave going through the region, and this is the effective grid on the, uh, on the calculation, and you can see that the, the shocks and the structures are not just not deformed by the ring average technique. So the ring average technique is a post solver, so the solver still calculates everything on the spherical grid. And after solving, we do calculations on this effective grid to make sure dt is much larger and there's no oscillations in the, in the pole. So this is an example of the two simulations that if you don't have, this is delta t, this is number of cells. So if you don't have the ring f, the dt drops as a slope of minus two, so it's quadratically. But you have ring f techniques and the dt is, drop, is dropping linearly, which for like 10 to the three cells, it could be a factor of 100 difference in time steps. So this is one used uh, in, in Gamera as well. All right, so from an MHD solver, you can have, you can develop MHDC solver whatever you want with all kinds of qualities, numerical methods, and from an MHD solver to a global magnetosphere model, which is Gamera sphere here. So there, there are other con considerations beyond the MHD. So a couple of things. First of all is how do you impose the solar wind condition, which is relatively easy in this case. And you need to Im embed a dipole field, which is very, very strong near the Earth. And also you have to consider the MI coupling because the ionosphere feedback feeds back to the solution to the to the to the to the magnetosphere conduction and the electrodynamics and also other non-MHD processes. So to do that, have to consider these uh, on the numerical uh, side of the models is that there's a couple of difficulties in dealing with the magnetosphere modeling. So the first one will be computational box is usually huge, right? It's usually 400 by 200 by 200 RE cubed. So that's a very large box, right? So to do that, we use non-orthogonal curvilinear grid, which adapted to the problem of the magnetosphere, place most of the resolution near the shock and inner region. And also you have the pole problem, which is axis singularity, so we use the ring average technique. And the boundary layer resolving, because boundary layer is very important in solar wind and couple magnetosphere coupling, so we have to resolve the boundary layer. You can use you know, tons of computational cells, but we do that by both. Use more cells and high order reconstruction schemes. And you have to deal with extremely low beta plasma, because in the inner region, beta is usually less than 10 to the minus five. And in other planets, it's even worse. So we do a background splitting technique to make sure the beta you know, is handled. And also uh, solar wind boundary, it's it's tough because you have to propagate solar wind in the in the in the boundary and it's we do a ballistic propagation in the go zones. I hope we have a better solution to that, but that's what we use now. And also low altitude boundary, we with the ionosphere we do electrostatic coupling. And I know Bill's been working on some electrodynamic coupling, and um, that's also an option to do in the future. And also ring current dyna dynamics, we use RCM, thermosphere, ion ionosphere, I'm looking forward to couple to uh, Thai GCM, Wacom X, which is one is already done with CMIT, and then Wacom Max is the next step, and rotating dipole, and I don't know how to do it, right? So, because the southern and northern dipole is not is offset, right? So right now we only use a dipole field. If they're offset, it has to rotate, right? So rotating with a background field, Good luck. Right. But isn't just that a series of different, isn't it just that the magnetic fields at a different angle at every time step? It is, it's more like, it's more numerical. 
Because to treat the dipole field properly in the inner region, we have to use 12th order Gaussian integrals to treat the background field. So if you do that every time step, it's, it's really, you know, uh, it's really expensive and you have to add additional uh, electric field. And that's related to the, to the locations and rotation. It's just complicated and expensive. So there's no plan right now to have a tilted dipole? Well, I mean, it's an offset dipole. Oh. Tilt is, is tilt easy. Is a, okay. yeah, tilt, tilt is, is easy. Okay. It's an offset dipole. So northern's here, oh. southern's oh, here. Oh, yes. You got the tilt. Yeah. Yeah. Tilt is, is relatively yeah. easy. But <laughs> offset dipole yeah. is difficult. Yeah. All right. But that's something to think for the future. Yeah. All right. So numeric methods does matter in magnetosphere simulations. I have another example later. So this is the one that the slide came from a talk I gave at the Astronome in Paris. So this is not Earth. This is a giant rotating magnetosphere, which is Saturn. And you can see that, just ignore the details, just look at the movie. So this is a Saturn simulation. You're looking down the north, northern hemisphere. So the sun is here, dawn dusk there, and solar wind comes. Saturn magnetosphere looks like Earth, but the difference is that it's rotating really fast. It's every 10 hours. And because the Saturn radii is 10 times larger than the Earth, so the shear velocity is very, very large in the, near the magnetic pulse. So if I run a higher order scheme and lower order scheme, and you can see the difference between these two. So you can see that you know, the shock is about right, because the sho shocks are self-steepening, so it doesn't matter, even if a very, very low order scheme can do good jobs on shocks. But the problem comes from the contact surface, which is the magnetic pulse boundary. And you can see that in the Saturn, in the high order one, you get these, all these vortices of KH and structures in the tail injections. But on the low res one, you get some wiggles, but it doesn't grow because the numerical diffusion kills the, the, uh, the, yeah. the, sh the shear layer and there's not enough growth rate. So if I put a probe here and there's no, almost no variations from this low resolution simulation, but high resolution simulations, you get all these variations, which are fairly consistent with what uh, Cassini has been found. So, so that's why we use a high order scheme, use a high order schemes in our simulations, not the low order schemes. Well, so these two simulations have essentially the same grid, but a different order in the solver. Same grid, same initial conditions, same boundary conditions, everything same except the solver has a different order, right? And you can see that the plasma, this, this circle is actually the plasma disk of Saturn. So the numerical spreading of that plasma is much faster because the numerical diffusion leaks those plasma out. While in this case, it, it's confined in a very fine region. So, so but that, these are other, other things, right? Okay, so talk about all these numerics, let's put everything, everything together. So that's the Earth magnetosphere. So this is, about a, uh, this is about the animation that I did when we first did down the uh, Gamera remix ionosphere, my magnetosphere. So we're trying to look at uh, the solution of the magnetosphere using different grids. One is the LFM grid, and you, we, I'm only showing a part of the LFM grid. And this is a grid, a more regular grid. It's a stretched spherical grid, and it's called an egg grid, using exact the same initial boundary uh, coupling and numerical schemes, just different grid. So let's run it. And what's coloring showing here, it's the equatorial plane. Color shows the uh, log, uh, I think it's the pressure in nanopascal. And uh, the contours are BZ equals zero contours, indicating where the field is tangent to the surface, could be with connection X lines. So you can see that uh, this is the field line currents, region one currents, and some region two currents, not very well. And you can see that you get to the uh, southward IMF driving, and you start to have reconnection, and the inner magnetosphere is, is heated. And when it turns northward IMF, and everything expands, and the tail becomes more dipole-like, and it's an adiabatic cooling process, and the inner magnetic pressure drops in, in this case. And the region, the, the currents, current system changed, and also the potential is, uh, is slightly different, and there's gonna be another southward turning. And in general, so the point here is that you can see there are small differences between these ones, but one reason is because this is a low resolution simulation. So the simulation size of this box is only 64 cubed. So you can see some differences in the, in the structure like the grid, but in general, these simulations are quite similar to each other. Although when reconnection happens, it's under-resolved anyway, so there, there are uncertainties in, in that case. Right? So the ionospheric solutions and the cross-polar cap potential showing here. All right. So after that, we've done a lot of work with the parallelization and all these uh, numeric schemes. And this is the most recent one that Corinne did 
on Cheyenne. So this is the highest resolution ever we've done. So I call it extra high resolution simulation. So what you see here is BZ minus B dipole in the equatorial plane, which showing you the dipolarization fronts. And this is the pressure in the XC down, down dust cut. And that's the fuel line currents in northern and southern hemisphere. So I'm going to let it run. And you can see that these uh, northward IMF, you got these KH, and they're rolling up, and you got this, uh, this shear layer. And then when IMF turns southward, it's negative. And you can see this KH, and KH is actually decreasing. And also, you start to generate all these bubbles in the tail, which is known as BBFs. Tail, and known as these BBFs. And you can see the, 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 the wobbling of the tail. It almost looks like there's like resonance coming back between the two, and I can show you all these later. And these are the, you know, these beautiful injections, fast flow channels from the tail, from the high resolution simulations. I'll, I'll come back to this uh, later, so don't worry if you don't really understand everything on this plot. So, so I'm going to show some results, uh, comparison between the resolutions. Before we do that, I'll give you some sense of what the resolutions I'm talking about. So. Uh, starting in the early days, LFM used to have single res, and I'm pretty sure some group used the single res to publish lots of papers, right? So the single res would be 64, 32 by 32 cells. I call it IJK, so on the grid like this, so I is the radio direction, so you have radio shells, it's I. J is from day to night, so day to night, that's J. And K is the rota rotating around the x-axis, so x-axis is from sun to earth. Right. So 64, 32, 32, with that small amount of cells, you can get a magnetosphere, which is amazing. Right. Double res doubles the other two directions. And now we moved to, so I'm not going to use any of these resolutions. I'm going to start with quad res, which, which is 128, octa is 256, uh, hex is 512. So these numbers may not mean too much to you, but the most interesting comparison is this is a very rough estimation so this is what I calculated so in the in the tail in the magneto tail which is the delta x is the is the radio uh, resolution of the grid divided by di which is the iron iron radius and you can see that quad res is larger than two two to three to five but oct res start to approach one which means that oct res is almost marginal to the fluid limit and hex res is definitely below one so this this is the so these three are above the fluid limit. Octares is marginal, and hex res is definitely below. Which means that yes. Di uh, is that iron gyro radius. Gyro radius. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's it, but this is these are rough estimations because the c temperature density changes all the time. So it's like on average it's like in this number. So hex res it's below the fluid limit. So what does that mean to the solution? Don't know yet, but I'll show you the results. Right. So another interesting uh, topic is the computational cost, which is very interesting. So if you do quad res for per hour simulation hour, for example, I have an event simulation which is ten hours. Right. So quad res with usual usual you know CPU time because the scales scaling is pretty good. So quad res it takes a point three to point point three k CPU hours to do one hour. So ten hour simulation would be. 2K, 3K, so that's very cheap. And Octaraz is slightly more expensive. It would be 4 to 5K per hour, but still, it's acceptable, affordable, right? But hex res is crazy. It's a, a, a 100K, which means that 10 hour simulation will cost 1 million CPU hour. That's extremely expensive. So to do hex res, it's nice, but we need uh, more computing power waiting for the next generation. Or we can do some one event with one or two events with the current computational power. So are you going to tell us, is there any point of hex res, given that you're, you know, you're <laughs> beyond the, <laughs> the grid size is you know, smaller than the ion gyro radius? I have some okay. results showing you. Like, do you we need? <laughs> <laughs> yes. How, how is that code scaling then? Like so the code scales, uh, so we have a scaling plot in the uh, in numerics paper. It scales quite linearly up to, I think John did a simulation with uh, 100,000 100, cores, and it's still pretty linear because it does hybrid hybrid uh, uh, parallelization. This is MPI plus OMP threading. So you cut down the communica communication overhead. 
But uh, and the co numerical cost is, is it just scaling with the number of cells, or is it worse than that? Uh, what what do you mean by the numerical cost? Like so, one hour of wall clock or model time. Uh -huh. It depends is it on. With the, is it just roughly the CPU hours is roughly proportional to the number of cells? Yeah, bas basically. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the VVF stuff can wait, but let's look at the KH first. And Karin hates this plot because it uses a rainbow rainbow color bar. But I found it's nice to see the the, the, the gradients, right? So this is these are this is a steady state, uh, not steady. Idealized simulation with five particles per cc in the solar wind, 400 kilometers per second, and it's a supersonic Mach 10 solar wind. And uh, IMF changes from northward IMF 5 nanotesla to southward IMF 5 nan nanotesla. So to start with that, and we let's focus on the KH. So the comparison is between hex res, oct res, and quad res. And we're looking down the northern hemisphere. So this is the dusk side. And you can see that the, the, this line is a BZ equals zero, means that IMF switched to, to southward. And you can see that there's little uh, active cage activity in southward, a little on the flanks, but not much on the day side. And um, most of the cage activity occurs in the northward IMF. So this is northward IMF, right? You can see the you can see the boundary layer, pretty thick. So oct and quad, uh, oct and hex, they're actually relatively similar to each other. It's like you have more structures in hex, but you can see the largest you know growing modes are about the same in in the two. And quad is definitely slightly under-resolved, all these, but you still have KH in quad. And, um, and um, quad is under-resolving, and the difference between the boundary layer of these two are, seems small between these two. And between the quad, it's large. And even you know, the magnetopause location is slightly different in quad. But these two seems to be quite similar to each other. And it, there's another interesting observation here is that in the northward IMF, southward IMF, the KH is much less compared to variations less compared to uh, northward IMF in southward IMF. So, uh, which supposed to be something observed by by observations, but people have doubts about it. But I think what happens here is probably that because we have high resolution ones, and then the boundary layer is is. Thick, uh, thinner in the in the north southward IMF simulations because the largest growing mode is basically depends on the thickness of the boundary layer. So when the southward IMF you have erosions on the day side, the boundary layer is thinner, so the K modes becomes smaller. Well, I mean the the, the lambda becomes smaller, so you get weaker cage on this side. But that's just my guess. But we do need more quantitative studies on these uh, cage properties, like what Slava did in his 2003 paper. All right, so back to the BBF, which is the most important thing to see whether resolution, yes? Um, yeah, so you, you mentioned Slava's paper. I thought in Slava's paper that he saw significant KH during southward IMF and was expecting it to be shut down relative to northward. Yet Gamera is having the opposite behavior. Well, Gamera's had lots of uh, KH in northward IMF, but, but very, less, southward, very less in south. It does, it does shut it off, yeah. whereas in LFM that doesn't happen. Yeah. Well, the numeric schemes are slightly different. And uh, the Gamera solutions are much less noisy. So LFM's got some, you know, some sometimes got numeric noisy also of the precision, single precision versus double precision. And the exact exact answer, we don't know. But that's just some speculations. I think for the Southwood IMF situation, um, it's easily interfered by the reconnection of the parallel uh, configuration. And on the other hand, uh, for the Northwood, Yes. Physically, that's what should happen. But LFM is not exhibiting that behavior. I think that's the, the quandary. Well, okay. the difference is that the steady state south or IMF never occurs in the in the real world. So if you look at the event simulation with variations, you might we may not have that much uh, KH in uh, in the event simulation. It's cheating. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about the basic. Thing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, okay, well, we can talk about that later. All right, so the BBF stuff, so what you look at here is the co a comparison of the delta B in the equatorial plane from three simulations. So hex, oct, and quad. So quad is basically in, in uh, you, you see that the BBFs, you have BBF structures in both simulations. And if you just look at the, the large scale, the channels, it's interesting that the BBF, first of all, so this is, there's north of IMF, there's no BBF, and then IMF hits. And you start to have KH. 
and then you start have BBF hitting the uh, inner magnosphere. But if you look at the uh, difference between oct and hex, you can see that the channels are actually not a factor of two difference, which so means these, that these BBFs are they observed? Yes. Yeah. Yes. My next slide will, will, will show you that. So, so these, you can, if you look at these channels, there, there, there are more structures in hex res, but those channels they're actually comparable in this case. I'm, I'm not calling this convergence, but it's just saying that something is determining the structure size of those channels, which is not a numerical grid above uh, octares. So that's my argument. So this is the uh, superposed uh, epoch analysis on the BBF properties. This is epoch time is before the BBF and this after the BBF. And this is the uh, result work done by Mike. And you can see that difference between uh, oct and hex on velocity and BZ, delta BZ, and density variations. And they're actually very uh, similar in these two, except the quad res has a much lower delta BZ in this case. So we'll say quad res is not in the same regime with oct and hex in this case. And answer your question. So this is the observed BBF properties. So that's the velocity enhancement. So that, ch that basically is a profile, statistical profile, sitting in the magnetic tail to see a BBF coming through. So you have enhanced velocity and decreased velocity. So that's the velocity, that's the BZ, and that's the delta, uh, delta N. So you can see that I would say the, the two octane hex are approximately in the same regime. Even the resolution in hex is much higher. So something else is controlling the, cha these cha the width of these channels, not just the numerical grids. All right, so come back to something more uh, related to the, uh, the, the CMIT stuff is that uh, magnusphere ion coupling. So you can see that this is one hour average of the fuel line currents in, in uh, oops, this is quad, this is uh, oct, this is hex. And you can see that the hex, oct, uh, quad res resolve the, under resolve the region one and region two currents in this case, which puts the most of the dual heating in the polar cap because there's no region one, region two collosion. Collosion currents has to close through the pole. So that's what happens. But when you go to oct and hex, you can see that the dual heating are mostly on the sides, which is more like a Weimar or other empirical models. So uh, you can see this. And also, you can see that the convection pattern slide changes are as well. And as in oct res, uh, in oct and hex res, and you can see that the most of the electric fields are, are confined between the region one, region two current closure, and there's very little potential contours outside 60 degrees on the night side but there's day side stuff, which means that the shielding is different with these models. So if you cut through the a line somewhere on the night side, very close to the pole, and you plot the potential contour down there, and you can see that at about 60 to 70 degrees, this is where the potential changes. And you can see that in oct and hex, in the hex res, the gradient is much, much larger. It means that the electric field is stronger in the region one, region two current closure region, which means that you will have a much better shielding in this, uh, these high resolution simulations compared to the quad res, and of, of course single and double. So this is actually a very interesting topic because some uh, RCM uh, group have done a paper which is about 15, 16 years ago showing that if they change the RCM uh, hot population to be cold plasma, which is MHD drift, Right, RCM has MH E cross B plus gradient curvature drift, but if you only have RCM have cold plasma, and then only drift to have this E cross B. And what they found is that when the particle transport similar to ideal MHD, the cold plasma sheet one produce excellent shielding and strong region two currents, which was never seen in the global models at that time. Right? So now we look at what Gamera has been doing that you can see the region one currents and region two currents, and we have a very strong region two currents, and these are actually di di diamagnetic ring currents. So coming from grad P cross B. So the grad P cross B gives you the diamagnetic ring currents and diversion of that current is the region two currents. So we have good numerics and enough grid resolutions to resolve the pressure gradient, which give us a reasonable region two current. So I think the question answered is that before we don't have enough resolution or we don't have good numeric schemes to resolve the pressure gradient, right? So going to a very extreme scheme, I just to show what I'm talking about. So I use a very diffusive Gamera sphere. So this is a Gamera sphere with lots of numerical diffusion. And then you can see that there's no region to currents completely. The same driving condition, same boundary condition, same coupling. So I'm gonna let it run. 
And this is the XZ plan showing the pressure. This is the velocity in the, in the equatorial plane. And this is the potential. This is the wind, uh, re, uh, fuel line currents, and there's only region one. And there's no region two. And this is still running. It's an animation. And you can see the magnetosphere goes into exactly steady state if you have excessive amount of numerical diffusion. But this is a pretty extreme case because I add lots of diffusion to, to the code. And you can see that when it runs, and the pressure is quite low, and then there's no pressure gradient established in the inner magnetosphere, and there's absolutely no region two currents. So this is what what, ha what that paper is mentioning. And with Gamera, we can model the diet. Uh, this is still running. It's not a steady state. It's not a snapshot. It's it's a, it's a movie. All right. So go back to my last one is the electron precipitation. So what if it, we have these three resolutions. So what, did, what does the electron precipitation look like in these one, these three ones? So looking at the northern hemisphere looking down, day side, night side, and quad, oct, and hex resolution, what I'm showing here is the precipitating number flux. So if I let it run, oops, before I run, oops, if I let it run. So it's still using the Feather 95 precipitation model. That's the original model, but with some modifications. Uh, electron temperature ratio is 1 over 5, and loss confidence is about 60%. And I put in a static diffuse precipitation boundary, which is based on the Felstein oval for activity. So it's not moving. And uh, you can see lots of structures in the high resolution simulation. So, so this is northward IMF driving. So the aurora goes, decays away, and there's a little bit of precipitation. Uh, down there, and then IMF turns southward now, and then you start to see these uh, dayside monoenergetic precipitations. This is this is in the hex res, and diffuse aurora as here as well. And then when the substorm occurs, and the night side kind of activity is going to start. So you see these structures of, from night side activities. And what's really intriguing is that you see these poleward moving structures. See later, maybe later on. See these poleward moving structures? So there are these poleward moving structures, and I haven't been able to figure out what are they. It sounds to me it has to it some, has something to do with your with, with waves proper resonating wave resonance between the two hemispheres, but we haven't been able to figure it out. So that's what. But that's an idealized simulation. So you see all these kind of structures. But the questions. So I, if you calculate the power between these two, they're actually com comparable. But not this one, because this one's much lower, because the density pressure gradient everything is just under resolved in this one, right? So I did a event event simulation, which is the March 28 event I did in my thesis, and that event has a southward turning and has a substorm in the in the simulation, and then this is the IMF condition, and this is the uh, the observation from polar UVI image using different algorithm inversion algorithms. So they get different answers for the power during hemispheric power during the event. So uh, uh, in my thesis, I try to match the maximum one. But in Gamera, uh, you can do, do either way. So I did this event simulation. So what you're looking at is the monoenergetic precipitation and the diffuse precipitation. And this is the pressure in the equatorial plane. This is the XC cut. And this is the IMF indicating where the time is. So if you let it run. It's mostly, you know, IMF just turns southward. This is BZ. And then activities going on. Tails get reconnection and inner regions energized. You see this diffuse aurora and also monogenic, monoenergetic aurora down here. And then IMF turns northward and it decays away. And as time goes on, it's going to turn southward again. And there's, gonna, there's a little substorm down there. And then you see another peak of the precipitation. So this is basically what the what the simulation look like. This is octres because hexres is too expensive, and I've shown you that the difference between these two are smaller compared to quadres. So we should probably do octres you know, for most of the events, right? So if you do analysis on the hemispheric power, and you can see these three are observations from polar UVI image that I took that from Barbara Emery's paper, and um, I this is the Gamera calculations. So the first thing to look at, it seems like uh, Germany 2000, 1998 is correct. Uh, uh, <laughs> but that's not true. So because the observations, there are uncertainties in these algorithms. So I don't know which one to use. I need you guys to tell me which one to use so I can change it. Uh, this is hemisphere, hemisphere, hemisphere power. Hemispheric power. <coughs> yeah. yeah. 
so you can see the camera is ca capturing most of the dynamics <coughs> even with the substorm and by the time it's slightly off. I'm not, I don't know what you know what the magnitude of this particular storm is, but it's a it's a pretty small one because the PC yeah. goes only to the minus ten. Okay. So it's a so moderate that's, that's moderate. Reasonable. Yeah. That seems reasonable. Then my my general impression, as I, I'm sure you recall, is that is that these historic measurements and, and many many similar derivations and, and estimates uh, may typically underestimate atmosphere. Okay, okay. We so always want, so we always want more for various reasons. Okay, so Jimmy is not right. <laughs> That's the I mean, well, <laughs> conclusion. Well, what's, the, which, which is which on that plot? The, uh, so this the is... Red, uh, the, uh, Red is Germany at all, yeah. 1998, and uh, this is Lumerzine. Not that different, right? Yeah, well, yeah. maybe like 20%. And the lowest one is uh, Lure. Yeah. <coughs> but these are these are all interpretations of the same data set. Same data, yeah. same, same image. Right. Yeah. So. It, another thing, the hemispheric power is potentially misleading because you can have a very wrong distribution and get the hemispheric power you want, but but it's putting the precipitation oh, yeah. in the wrong place. Sure. Yeah. So are you trying to say at I'm the, putting this in the wrong place? No, I'm not <laughs> saying you're not, but I'm saying looking at patterns like you have on the right there give you a better sense of how well it's working. If yeah. you can compare that with images or data or some kind of data. Yeah, I, I do. So, so this is the uh, the mono energetic precipitation in the event. I'm only looking at the busy dominant case because by dominant case, most of them on the lots of them on the day side. So busy dominant case, and you can see this related to the upper region one currents. So that's the mono energetic precipitation, and this is the diffuse solar oval in this case. And you compare with ovation prime, it's about you know this is the upper region, upper current region, and then the diffuse typical diffuse solar oval. And these two grids are different. So it looks like this one is a lower latitude, but it's actually not because this is the grids are different in, in these cases. And if you look at the mono to diffuse can, uh, ratio, so in these in these calculations, it's about the power is about 25 percent. So normal mono is about 25 percent of diffuse, which is quite similar to what you get from Ovation Prime. But Ovation Prime is a statistical model in this case. So I guess uh, this is about all I have. So the future work, uh, so Gamera is under development, it's still development and in development, and it's, it's going to carry the uh, LFM legacy forward. And we're coupling to various RDV codes like CHIMP, RCM, TIGCM, IPWM, and even trying to do some uh, one way driving with Wacom X, and everything's on the way. And Octoraz may be suitable for most space weather applications based on the comparisons I have. There's no way, no, no need to hit the fruit limit, in, to me. To, that's my personal opinion. Someone else may not agree. So we're also expanding the applications to other space plasma systems, including Mercury, Mars, Jupiter, and Neptune. And I'm very looking forward to work on the solar corona problem uh, with uh, great groups here. And also, you know, exoplanetary magnospheres. You know, every failed simulation is an exoplanet magnosphere. <laughs> <laughs> so the take-home message is hex and higher resolution are nice. And they're actually desired for non MHT physics research, magnetosphere physics. So if we have the power, computational power capability to do these kinds of simulations, it's always nice and to include you know, additional physics, but they're extremely expensive for now. So we are waiting for the next generation supercomputers to, to do all these more you know physical studies. So I think that's it. And any questions? <laughs>